And to kick it off, can I introduce uh, Peter Helms and Margaret Patey and Richard uh, Jolly from Limwood College and ask Peter to start the presentation. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senna everybody. I am Peter Helms. I'm the Chief Operations Manager at Linwood College, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Margaret Praiti, our visionary principal, and Richard Jolly, our enthusiastic STEM coordinator. We're here today to introduce an exciting initiative we've been working on that just happens to be an answer to the question of the session. This question, strengthening the culture of stakeholder engagement, what are some new secondary and tertiary learning pathways designed for real-world opportunities, expectations, and earnings? Well, first of all, we are from Linwood College, located about two kilometers from here on the east side of Christchurch. So our presentation addresses how a 60-year-old decile II school that is 25% Maori and Pacifica with almost 100 children who use English as a second language in post-earthquake Christchurch are going to go about strengthening a culture of stakeholder engagement, new learning pathways for the real world, and lead from a modern learning environment to this modern earning environment. Easy, right? Well. Margaret Paid, he said, We've, we had to do a reality check on these questions. And as you can imagine, these are huge questions for us. In fact, uh, to get anywhere, these things need to, needed to be created almost from scratch for our unique and challenging environment. Culture, as we learned yesterday, is something that an organization needs to work at. And, it is, and that is the first thing that needs to be developed, learning pathways and making them real for every student is the goal, but how? Real world opportunities and expectations? Yeah, that's easy to say, but it sounds good. But again, how? Okay, like as one would expect, Linwood College has a clear mission, which you can read. This is a noble mission, and it's entirely focused on students' well-being. And Linwood College has a clear vision of what it wants to be. These are laudable and exciting visions. These are incredibly challenging visions. Place of transformation. There's not, a, there's not a world leading school anywhere that does not have these or share these visions. We do live in the real world though, and this has made us realize, as Professor Sir Paul Callahan has been known to say, that a, a vision without funding is an hallucination. <laughs> Linwood College realized that it needed help, and to secure help, we were going to have to do things very differently and earn it. We were going to have to introduce a philosophy that would drive a culture of stakeholder engagement to unprecedented levels in New Zealand. We need to create new secondary and tertiary pathways with a completely new approach to anything that we have done before. And we realized that securing real world opportunities would only be possible by working in partnership with where? The real world. And I will hand over to our principal, Margaret Paiti, to tell you about Linwood's approach. It's something new for New Zealand. So this, I'll be going over to A&E and getting an x-ray. However, so if I stumble through this, I've got a really good excuse, don't I? Um, I suppose like many of you, over the past three years, you've had a lot of questions. And questions around engagement, culture, learning pathways, and making a school a real world experience to benefit students. And within the context of Christchurch, as a time for change and radical change and well needed within our community. So through this passage, I was reminded of some previous research from an exciting and a very successful program in the US in the 1990s. And that was STEM education. And it was 
driven by the aspirations of ensuring that the students were able to succeed and prosper in the world that they were going into. They understood that students were drifting away from science, technology, engineering and maths. And the government at the time, after the science and technology uh, partnerships had brought forth the STEM education, decided that they needed to find real stakeholders to engage and develop pathways through the secondary and tertiary programs and get children the best opportunities. And part of that was looking at schools in the most deprived and vulnerable areas in the US as well. The US system of STEM is about a billion dollars in my understanding, and it's led by government, industry, and endorsed by educational initiatives. It was designed to strengthen the national um, base from technology industries and make them more competitive in the marketplace. It did have an economic driver, but the economic driver was about how do they get the young people engaged, how do they get them into the real world to ensure that not only are they productive, that they're participating, but they also prosper and, and thrive in the environment as well. So the question came to me, is it applicable in New Zealand? So we decided to find out. And this is how did we do it? Well, when you're audacious, one of the first things you decide to do is, who do you go talk to? So, why not? Ask Professor Sir Peter Gluckman. He could only say no. Rung him up, and over within a month's time, he came to the college. He stopped me in the reception, and basically, we had a rigorous interrogation around why was I thinking of STEM education? And then he said, audacious, do it. And he stayed in school for three hours after that. One of the gems that he shared was, you need to communicate to the community. No one understands what it is. And when you embark on a project, you need to verify within the community what do they know and do they actually want to engage in STEM or you may as well stop. So, what was the next step? We commissioned Elizabeth Connor, the winner of the Prime Minister's Science Prize. And we asked you to interview a cross section of people within our community and stakeholders. Her aim was to create a publication, which I have here for you today. And guess what? You're lucky enough to receive a free copy from us. So please, have a, a good read of it. And uh, it was to explain STEM, education in a New Zealand context, and also a Linwood College approach. We wanted her to get perspectives from the tertiary sector, business, international experts, teachers, students, alumni, anyone that ha would be able to help tell a story and a story people didn't understand. We call this publication a community conversation starter because we had to start somewhere. So let me introduce some of the people that Elizabeth in sort of interviewed. Of course, as I mentioned before, it started with Sir Peter Gluckman. From there, our first and most rapid adopters were the tertiary institutes. Who knew we were breaking new ground with Lincoln, UC, CPIT agreeing at a single point of collaborating together? From there too, we had the Liggins Institute work alongside us and the head of science Helen Mora, that came from there, gave her perspectives as a teacher. Dr Ganesh Nana, he said to me, one of the best things students need to have is a curious mind to question, and they should al always say why. 
and he said to me, you need to say, why not? Why not STEM? Why not now? And the dreamers of the future. Harry Lochnan, one of our ex-students, who doesn't see barriers and wants to create a better place and a better world. We also went outside internationally. Elizabeth Harity from the Gates Foundation. She actually set up, and this is how it worked in Chicago, over the holiday break, the mayor decided to close down nine schools, and over the holidays, nine STEM schools were created. Rapid change and transformation, she was part of that. The head of arts, the elephant in the room when it comes to STEM education. Where does the creative imaginations and thinking occur? So, Emily Whiteman gives her perspective. It is critical when you're trying to use imagination and connect with humanity and get that sense of beauty. Science has that within it. Peter Townsend. I don't think I need to really say much about that other than he's instrumental to Christchurch's rebuild. We needed the business employers to give their viewpoint about things. From there, Business New Zealand. Why not ask Phil O'Reilly his thoughts and get the perspective? We understood what was happening in the global sense. Was New Zealand in the same frame and thinking? Yes, they were. As well as we've got Harry Lane from the Epic Centre, our students are currently going in there and getting excellent experiences and actually in the workforce seeing what it's like and the dynamic environment that it is. And former DVC from UC, Professor in town. A myriad of people and a myriad of understandings. It is here as well, as I introduced before, STEM education is about ensuring that all students have the technical skills and knowledge and expertise to be able to thrive. Associate Professor Mary Berriman. She said to me when I first posed it to her, she goes, oh, an imperialistic viewpoint of colonialism coming into a schooling environment. I had to convince her and it only took a minute, and it changed her world. And she decided STEM was what Māori were needing. It was con it's contextualised. It's about the real world, it's about connecting, it's engaging, it's student-centred. It's hands-on learning, but it's hands-on learning with a purpose. She said, that's te kotahitanga. And she says, for Māori, how many actually do science technology? How many actually take the next level in maths? So for me, another breakthrough. We also have from business, Rob Gilmore, his side around construction. And I think we all have perspective that construction is just building. He told me, no, it's not. He says we have entry level to PhD level. We have the people that are holding the signs to the people that are actually researching problems and doing projects that require massive amounts of thinking and design behind it. Where is the engine room within the schooling environment to get them ready? So I'd now like to hand over to Richard Jolly, who's going to actually tell you a little bit more about what happened and where to next. Thank you, Margaret. I um, didn't fall over yesterday, I didn't bash myself onto a gate, so I'm actually able to stand up, so I will. So I'm Richard Jolly, I'm new STEM coordinator at Linwood College, and we are embarking on a, a big journey. So we've approached our stakeholders and got an overwhelming positive response. Um, tertiary sector, as Miranda's gonna tell you later, they're early adapters of, of STEM, going great. The most interesting one for us, we've been to businesses, they've said, fantastic, we want to be involved in STEM. Issue is, for, um, 
I'm a classroom teacher. The conversation needs to be held. How do they help us? How do we get involved? We've got to work on that. That's not the easy one. That's the harder one we've got to solve. But they're overwhelming behind us. Government agencies, yeah, definitely. They're behind us. And Maori and Pacifica communities. Initially, you mentioned STEM. They go, ooh. But once they understand it, they are so behind it because it's going to be uh, higher student engagement. So we've got lots of the stakeholders behind us. So what's happening in the school? Well, first of all, it's the conversation. Conversation with the students, conversations with the parents. And what are we doing? We're um, cross-curricular, <coughs> project-based learning. It's the start of the journey. It does involve a lot of change, culture change, cross-curriculum. Not easy, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, what else are we doing? Uh, we're part of the, we're talking with the Canterbury Tertiary Cluster. We're providing pathways. And to make it all happen, we need an advisory committee to, to get things moving along. So Peter's been working really hard, and we've signed up Professor in town as our chair of our advisory committee to push things forward. And we're talking with lots of business, Canterbury Tertiary Alliance, and Maori Pacific Community to get that advisory committee going. So why we introduced STEM? It's for stakeholder engagement, secondary and tertiary pathways, and real world opportunities for our students. That's why we're doing it, and we it's going to work. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
And it came out 15 years later, quicking and kicking and screaming, having worked with seven ministers of education from both sides of the fence. How on earth did a pimply-faced, stuttering boys high school kid get there? God knows. And I thought, shit, they'll know one day. <laughs> Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah. And that was some feat with Margaret I did. Anyway, but nothing has prepared me for my last two years. And I get quite emotional about this, but I'm, I'm going to try not to. Um, I believe I've had a privileged role in education. I, I haven't been a principal. I don't want to be a principal. I haven't been a CEO. I don't want to be a CEO. I just want to do stuff. And with me, what you see is what you get, as Margaret well knows, and others who know me know. But two years ago, I got a phone call from a mate of mine who had similarly had a role in getting me into the beehive, I might add, who said, you want to come to Christchurch, get out of the ministry, come to Christchurch and run a colouring in competition. Now, I told him where he could put that and said, what are you trying to do? He said, well, we're trying to work out a way of engaging school kids in what they want in their new program we're going to build. I said, well, you're not having a colouring in competition. So I said, I'll come down and have a yarn. So I flew down to Christchurch and we spent a day workshopping. I said, first of all, you're not doing colouring in a competition. Secondly, what are you doing for early childhood? Oh, they'll just draw stick men. No, they won't. I said, what are you doing for secondary? Oh, well, it's too difficult, you know, but I said, no, it's not. So we ended up with this thing called The Amazing Place, which is a, a strategy to engage young people between, uh, from early childhood through to age 18 in what they wanted for the future of their city. It's not being built for me. And... Um, I have had this incredible two years. Cheryl Doig was uh, one of our judges for both of our sets of competitions, which we'll explain in a minute, and has been, in a, in a way, my mentor, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Cheryl, who you'll see in the video clip. Um, I have, I, I'm not actually here today from the ministry or from Sarah. I'm actually here on behalf of the children you're going to see shortly, because they're going to tell us. I'm not going to tell you about this thing. They are going to tell you in a minute. I've made a six and a half minute documentary. We've got thousands of hours of film, and we've put this together, so the children, their parents, and the people that the children inspired, and young people, not just children, the people, the, the, the people that were inspired by their ideas tell you about this in here. I don't know why I'm so passionate about this. It, it really gets me emotional. I love it. I want to die doing it. I'm trying to persuade the ministry to take the program over from Sarah, because Sarah said it's not their job. It should be in the Ministry of Education should be carrying on this program. Or it mightn't fit our profile of at-risk children and the underachievers. Every child in Greater Christchurch is at risk. I know that because I've seen them. I read the reports from the teachers on how the earthquake has affected the children and the teachers and their parents. And it doesn't matter whether they're Decile 10 or Decile 1, Māori Pacifica or Pākehā, children in crisis are at risk. And I passionately believe that we need an overall youth engagement strategy, or which there isn't one, to involve the young people in building their city. I don't know why I feel so passionate. I have no idea why I feel so passionate about this. But it's captured me, and I absolutely love it. So I'm going to step aside now. I'm going to hope this thing works. And I'll have about 30 seconds after this to sum it up. See what you think. Bad. M A D. Team awesome. <laughs> the Trojans. Okay, well, the competition is designed for school kids to have a say in the new um, city rebuild. And the idea is each team chooses an anchor project, like the stadium or the bus interchange, and they each create a proposal about it, like including design, funding, community benefits, etc. And then present it to the judges for judging. Uh, it's a model. Yeah, it, yep. it went pretty well. We might have spent a lot of time on it, but the end result looks pretty good. I think the competition is about really including young people and really getting their opinions um, so that we can actually try and figure out what can make a city great for everyone. So it's, it's looking at the earthquake and the rebuild of Christchurch through a child's eye, which is actually quite a unique way of looking at it. It's a really cool idea to let like, us have our say on what Christchurch should be like. and yeah. For them, feeling like they were a part of the rebuild was really important, that they had a say or that they could, could try to have a say was really important for them. What's amazing about this for them is that somebody is prepared to take their ideas seriously. That's actually the amazing part to these guys. 
If you want a good team helping to build the future of Christchurch, you could take away a group of these children and you'd be all right. It's really important to push the kids outside uh, siloed learning, and, and schools have a lot of siloed learning. It's just something you don't normally do in a school. Normally in school you just teach what's in the curriculum, everything's basically the same, you go on your nice field trips and everything else, but this was more real. It feels like you actually have some power over what's going to happen in the city. I think that there should be more things like this, especially with the future and the design of Christchurch, to have the young people involved, having a say, and their voice get, getting out there in this way, I think is really important. So, yeah, more of it. Kind of appealing now to stay in the city, like we when we're older we, and bring up families in the city because we've been part of the de development of the city, so. Makes it more exciting. Yeah. I, I think at best, all of these proposals gave us something new rather than something that we were already familiar with. So a very sustainable building made in an innovative way with an innovative construction technique with photovoltaics, with a, a dome that allowed you to climb up this koru, um, another playground. Um, this was really imaginative, wasn't it? Very detailed, a very difficult thing to take on a big bit of open space in the city, particularly when you're so young. Isn't it good when you're at the age where you say, wouldn't it be neat to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And somebody says, me now, and off you go, you know? Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> and we lose that in society. So the process tonight with the Year 12 and 13s was the exciting slash complicated element, where four of them at Year 12 and 13 level had to live pitch their idea or their project to the judges. The new Christchurch City Central Library. We have sought to provide a wide range of rich and rewarding experiences in the retail precinct. Growing organically, the space works alongside the emergent culture on its way up in Christchurch, consisting of three phases. Our development of the Avon River will increase interaction and give the city a vibrant, modern feel in areas which have not been focused on in the past. So I will ask the judges now to convene and to make their final decisions. We can't fit on a duck. A goose? A goose is a good one. That's big enough. I think it's just brilliant uh, to give children of Christchurch a voice, actually. I just think they've gone through so many upheavals over the last couple of years. And so for the initiative of them to be able to have just dream big um, in such a big piece of property, it's an amazing opportunity for them to create their future here as well. To be able to broaden them past what they know has been a big challenge so that they're thinking about what might be possible rather than just what has already been. They Google earthed the actual plot of land and we put it up on the interactive whiteboard and they started drawing things onto the air so, and then the creating and the planning. They've been writing letters to John Key. Um, so there's just a wealth of amazing learning experiences that they've been involved in. The children have loved it from day one. They've loved having a project, going home, talking to their parents about it, finding what they could add, bringing resources into the centre to glue on it. They've loved it. Oh, oh, Everybody wants to win, but yeah, we're definitely going to win. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we're so going to win. <laughs> Those children who were involved in the very beginning, if they can participate to the end and can see which of their ideas survive and which not and why, then they will make this place their place and they will care for it and, and play there and they will tell everybody, look, I was involved here. I haven't come across a briefing that was so well prepared so far in my uh, professional career, I must say. And our team here are five professionals coming from uh, four different companies, all bringing their background. So this is a, a superb combination, really. Christchurch is going to be an amazing place! Yeah! Well, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I still don't know why I'm so passionate about this. I love Christchurch, and um, I live in Wellington. I don't know why I love Christchurch. 
But when I see that and I see kids say they want to stay here and bring up their children here, when I see in all of the seminars we've had, we put all the winners and the place getters together with the relevant project teams and architects for the projects. And in every instance, these decision makers were gobsmacked. And, um, and that's what it meant to me as a teacher. Damn it. And so <clears throat> I hope I'm on the right, right track, but I want it to continue. So I'm Malcolm Bell, and that was their story. Can I now introduce uh, Miranda Satherswate, who was the STEM coordinator at CPIT, and she manages several STEM programs in, in engineering and science and robotics and also the electric vehicle project, which our following speaker, Bryn, uh, also works on. So please welcome Miranda. Okay, hands up who knows Miley Cyrus, or have heard of Miley Cyrus? Yeah? Okay. How many people here have actually heard of Brian Green? One person. Okay, what does Brian Green do? He's a physicist. He's a, actually a particle physicist and he's, he's studying string theory. And if I was to ask that question to a class of students, you'd find that they'd know the top 100 pop stars, but they wouldn't know the top 100 scientists. So when we're looking at culture and where culture starts, we kind of want to look at making changes that are going to help our students see the world differently because the world they're going to go into in the next 100 to 200 years is going to change ferociously. We've all seen the graphs. Increasing carbon dioxide, reducing water quality, increasing population. And we won't be around to see the end consequences. They will. So what is STEM really about? Well, my role, just back I'm here as a CPIT STEM coordinator, and my role is specifically to look at providing students with project-based learning programs in robotics, ICT, and engineering, so that they can start to put together some of the solutions to solve tomorrow's problems. Our stakeholders are the students and their children and their grandchildren, but our stakeholders are also the industries that are here starting to innovate fantastic products that put New Zealand in the front line internationally in this environmental solution market. So if we want to look at what we're doing at CPIT to get going, we're actually in the implementation stage of some of the things you've just seen. So if we have a look at um, the examples here of what we've got in terms of architectural planning, we've taken our students on um, a, an actual uh, campus development project where they've been put together to look at how we can deal with the three E's, the education, the engagement, but also the capability of putting together a building that is going to contain things they can learn from, that can show uh, the infrastructure so that they are in an environment where they are learning. That is an example of our modern learning environment. And I've got a video here to show you later once the um, technical staff have got that part sorted. Aside from... Uh, it's interesting, we're not going any further on this slide here. Could you give me a hand with this? Thanks. I don't know what you've done with this. <coughs> yeah, so. Okay, we've got it. Fantastic. Okay, so if we look at our stakeholders, who are our stakeholders? Well, we've had a lot of talk about communities, and the communities that we're dealing with in terms of stakeholders for education are our technology sector. So we're looking at ecosystems which include agri-tech, science, healthcare, software, electronics, and these companies are all in Christchurch. So we've got some big stakeholders that need skilled quality labour, and they need students that can actually deal with the 21st century learning environment, but also that can design and implement products for uh, introduction overseas markets. So we have got a bit of an agenda of making sure our students learn how to collaborate in real live projects. Some of the collaborations we have in our STEM projects at CPIT involve organisations like NASA and VEX Robotics and VEX IQ, and we collaborate on the level of getting teachers involved in projects and students working together in teams on these projects following these government initiatives. So there's a lot of issues in science and in aeronautical engineering, for example, 
and also in government initiatives that we can bring down to projects that students can be involved in. So what does it look like in terms of a modern earning environment? Well, we believe that basically we need to get the students developing the mindsets to cope with the 21st century problems, uh, that they can be confident and connected, that, that they naturally collaborate, and that they can rapidly come up with solutions for, for these issues. Because these issues are going to culminate, and they will occur rapidly as, as the resources deplete on the planet, and we deal with some issues of overpopulation, we need rapid solutions. Here we've got a, one project here which is e-velocity, that's the electric vehicle project. <coughs> and that's really about creating transport that doesn't use fossil fuel. At CBIT we apply an integrative STEM model. So that's exactly uh, what we've looked at with uh, Linwood. It's a model where you integrate the different parts of the curriculum to come up with solutions for your problem. So you involve a number of teachers. We use youth guarantee standards. They are basically uh, the new standards that have come out from NZQA and we can apply them through project-based learning and designing a product. At the moment I'm working with NZQA in areas like physics and technology to link some of our project-based learning to standards so it gets taken seriously by educators. Okay, so what are the key projects that we're currently delivering, we're implementing? We have sports, a Sports Smart Holiday Program, which basically is about the IT involved in sport and implementing new uh, regimes for that. We've got eVelocity, which is an electric vehicle initiative and boot camps for that, for that area of teaching and learning. So that covers like electro technology and materials technology. We've got years 11 and 12 chemistry competition where students learn to compete to solve environmental issues. We've also got 11 and 12 science competitions which are broader, they're more about biology and physics. An EcoBots program at year 12. We have VEX IQ, which is a um, STEM based course that comes from the United States with robotics. Uh, those camps come on uh, in about six to eight weeks. We've got a two day camp for teachers. Uh, we have programming camps, liquidity, aqua science holiday course, which is this one here. And these students here have worked in collaboration with engineers without borders to come up with solutions on how to clean the water for systems. We also run IT girls coding workshops for Year 9 and 10 girls, and the next program we're running is Airtime Holiday Program, and that's really about how to get um, aeronautical solutions for rockets, um, aircraft, etc. All those courses are free for students in the Canterbury region. We also offer professional development, because teachers that come along and they learn how these courses are set or put together, they can, um, they can learn about project-based learning, they can learn about STEM, and they can learn about how to collaborate together, because they have a common goal, which is saving some uh, pretty important resources, coming up with some intelligent solutions, and getting their students to learn how to collaborate. Here, this is VEX Robotics. Here you've got a robot here which is stacking um, cubes as part of the competition. Um, industry is our stakeholder here as well as the students, which means that our curriculum is focused on industry level standards. We look at uh, in industry level uh, programming and industry level CAD courses. And our tutors are all qualified professionals. Many of them may, maybe have been in the academic system for a while or they've worked there in industry. So they have, I guess, effective industry skills. These, these, uh, this team here, they're basically designing rockets, which is part of our next course, launching them and seeing which one can go the furthest, how you get greater pressure, et cetera, projectile motion. We've got a big target because a lot of this is driven by IPENs, that is the shortage of engineers and the shortage of scientists is going to bottleneck our development in this country. And the specialist courses in um, girls, courses for example, or uh, female lecturers providing support as well as female engineers will increase the number of students that are female in the STEM market, which we think is really important for developing those Christchurch uh, economy I guess the, the companies, and also thickening that pipeline into engineering. They've got some great qualities. We have great involvement from current students on our courses. So talking about collaborating, we collaborate with students that are actually currently learning at CPIT. They become ambassadors, and so they learn the qualities of how to manage other people as well as bring products to market by seeing some of these products that are designed. Systems of mentors. These mentors also target the major barriers, which we see are in physics and mathematics. So they provide tutoring for students that come through as part of the STEM developments. So a lot of it's student driven, as in driven from the students at CPIT. We have a big centre for Marion Pacifica. So our stakeholders are obviously Naitahu and a number of Marion Pacifica students that come through. 
we target uh, trades and STEM scholarships specifically into engineering and into architectural studies, also into the trades, because we'd like to see the leadership fall into the hands of the people that uh, feel a stewardship of the land. They really belong to the space. We want to see them lead in the next 100 years, um, rather than just bringing in foreign labour and potentially uh, losing some of our key aspects to other countries. We'd like our Indigenous people to lead. If you want more information about how STEM works, you're a stakeholder as well. And so we have a large industry day on the 28th of August from 2 to 6 p.m. And there are about 100 different companies there that, we're, that are part of the STEM network that we've already developed. The research I did overseas, and I've been to Silicon Valley, I've got family that live there. The, the STEM hubs that work are the ones where you've got schools that are directly in partnership with business. That there are no borders really between the strategic goals of schools and of businesses because a stronger economy makes a really safer society. And to get those 6,000 NEETs, that is students between 19 and 25 off the street and into employment would make this place a much better place. So I guess that's our biggest target. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll catch those later. Thank you. Can we now turn the spotlight on to Bryn Rivers, who also works um, with Miranda in a couple of, of those projects. And Bryn comes from software developing company Dev Mobile Software and a range of other um, associations. I met him at the Soft Academy Software Cluster. He's a great networker. But we, I also met him as the grandparent of a, uh, a grandson who's doing Bryn's Code Club. So outside school hours, teaching kids to get beyond fiddling with uh, applications and being left to their own devices and actually doing some computer science. And his first job was working with a, a 15 year old female who's actually his mentor as well. So Bryn is going to walk, show us some stuff and demonstrate and we hope to have that back projected as well. So can I pass you over to Bryn and please welcome him. Thank you. I'm not a, I'm not a professional educator, so I feel a wee bit of a fraud right now. I work for, I had to take a real job. I now work for Wynyard Group. We build software for detecting money laundering, the financing of terrorism, police investigations, and corporate risk management. I'm a solution architect. I work across the corporate risk and uh, money laundering and financing of terrorism software. We have a couple of hundred staff in Christchurch. We're growing all the time. We're trying to hire new developers all the time. We're bringing lots of developers in from overseas. It looks like a bit of a UN in the dev floor that I'm on. But as a sideline, I run Code Club. It's a, <coughs> it's a volunteer network nationally of industry-sponsored and fostered clubs, after-school clubs for kids. We are run by volunteers, and I've got to say thank you to John Crichton and Jared. They've been our adult supervision for the first three terms. We originally kicked off in Aranui in Portsmouth Street, and for you... For those of you who know your Christchurch geography, Portsmouth Street's one block along from Hampshire Street. So it's quite a culture shock arriving in the code club there. We have uh, industry sponsorship from Wynyard, from Sourced, and from TARDIS. At one end, some companies give us money, and at the other end, some companies give us gear. It's good. We ran in Orion Health for the first couple of terms. We did 30 nights, we ate 300 pizzas. I hate Domino's $5 value pizzas with a passion now. I got to the point where I would go across the road to the subway to avoid the Domino's pizzas. We have three different streams. We've got Code Club Junior. It's for intermediate age children. We teach Scratch and some Python. We've got Code Club Senior, which is for high school kids. With that, we teach with uh, microcontrollers and other hardware. And then there's Code Club Pro, which we're planning, which is uh, for teaching teachers. And then for the helpers, we have Come and Code Pub, where we'll sit down and discuss what we're going to teach and how we're going to teach it. We've also got programs going with uh, Christchurch Libraries in the uh, IT Lab equipped libraries here in Christchurch, 
And we've also got a girls only code club coming up at Selwyn House in the final term of the year. It's all industry linked. My boss has uh, suggested to my co-workers that helping co-cubs could positively benefit their career path. So there will be industry sponsorship and we're trying to get schools to be adopted by businesses. So for example, uh, if a school wishes to deliver an after-school IT program, we'll help them identify a local business who can help. So why did CoCub come about? Um, for me, it was a bit of karma. In a former life, I've written software for cigarette vending machines, online gambling, and alcohol promotion. <laughs> so I, I figured I'd better make the world a better place. I'd like personally to convert today's children from content consumers to content creators. The problem is there are not that many content creators. And by content, I don't mean just making another web page. I mean building another trade me, building another YouTube. I am also personally interested in making people from de device consumers to device creators. I want the kids who come to my courses to be able to look at a centimeter, which you can buy to measure your power consumption, and see how they could build one. And some of our students actually do. I'm interested in the maker movement. I'm interested in being able to leave the top off something and figure out how it works. And I want my children and I want the children <coughs> who come to Code Club to be able to take the lid off and hopefully put it back together again. It takes about 10,000 hours to master something, be it a sport or an instrument or programming. Mm. At the end of the Code Club, there are 9,970 hours along that journey. I'm also interested in inviting these people into industry, starting with an apprenticeship model. You arrive as an apprentice, you become a journeyman and move through a number of different businesses, learning different skills, and then move on to a master craftsman. How do we teach coding to kids? It's difficult. The thing is, coding's not hard. It's the problem solving we find the children struggle with. We start with recognizable things. We build an MP3 player. We build a pulse rate monitor. We build a robot, we build a power meter. Everything we do is linked to stuff that the kids recognize from home. Working in a team is also hard, and software is a team sport. You're basically playing a game, and you're preparing yourself for the next iteration of the game. We do it with plug and play in electronics. We found that the, the kinesthetic nature, building another web page is pretty boring. You, know, you built one web page, you build another, after a while it becomes a bit of a yawn. But with this, we've got water flow sensors, Radio links, temperature sensors, ultrasonic ranges, all sorts of electronics which the children plug together. We teach a bit of basic electronics as well, so that once they've broken something, they can hopefully put it back together again. We teach some fairly advanced topics around writing robust and reliable code, debugging and testing and refactoring. And it's largely a process of offering a few hints, showing some sample code, and then wandering around the room as the children build something. So I had a title on this card called Mind the Gap. So for those of you who have been in London, I should be saying this in a thick Jamaican accent. The, the best and the worst developers. There's about a 25, or does, about 25 times between the best and the worst. I'd like to make lots of best developers. There's quite a gap between the hobbyist developer to the commercial developer. And there's a gap between what's taught in tertiary education and business. And I'd like to close those gaps. There's also the process of unlearning. If any of you have ever learnt, say, the violin and how to do the fingering wrong, it's quite a difficult process to unlearn something. So hopefully we're planting some good seeds. We'd like to help with Code Club Pro for teachers. So teachers could come along and we'll explain the basic mechanics of what we do in the commercial software and even the prospect of internships has been discussed. TEDx like podcasts. So when it comes to teaching kids to code, Beware the platform zealot. It doesn't really matter what you teach them with, be it Raspberry Pi, Arduino, Netduino, Beagle, Pick. The basics are important, and there are some really good books which cover the basics, and they're the sort of books you can pick up and read a chapter and learn something. The whole thing with programming is it's a mindset. It takes you about 20 minutes to get into the groove when you're programming. So I worry for a generation who have Twitter, Facebook, email, and SMSing. The most productive night we ever had at Code Club was when the Wi-Fi was broken. We didn't get a Wi-Fi password. And 
suddenly it was very quiet and everyone was very focused. So, we have some demos. One of the students built an MP3 player. We've also got some other projects coming along. This is a $45 trade me purchase. The guy who does my dishwasher, fixes my dishwasher, said, you write code? And I went, yep. And it was one of those, will you fix my computer moments in the making. His daughter is blind. She's getting into cooking. She can't see what's on the packets of the condiments. So using this MP3 player and a barcode scanner, some St. Beat students are going to record uh, audio tracks for the different condiments. So she can pick something out of the cupboard, run it past this, and it'll go, Vegemite. I must admit, I wanted Robbie Coltrane or Graham Henry to record some as well. So, we do... The way it pays for me, one of our students built this. It measures the power consumption of a hairdryer. I have to get this back to my daughter. So, with this device, you run it, you plug the hairdryer in, and it gives you the price of the electricity you're using and how much it will cost you an hour to run. The young woman who built this, you could see at one stage just all the cogs aligned and she really nailed it. It was about three weeks in and it was an amazing contrast. There were a group who were just mucking around on one side and this young woman, she sat down, quietly built this and did a really smooth demo at the end. That's the one thing that the industry volunteers get out of it. You see success and you hopefully see those people flow through into the industry. Well, um, thank you very much for your time. I've got some demos if people are interested. Come and see me afterwards. So finally, before we open it up to discussion, can I ask uh, Jake Miller to come and join us up here? Uh, <coughs> Jake is the, uh, was last year's head boy at Christchurch Boys High School. Jake, uh, many of you might know, lost his father in a rather tragic accident at Franz Joseph three years ago, four years ago? Box Glacier four years ago, sorry. And Jake's bounced about back from that, but I think, Jake, from what you've told me before, that's really sharpened your resolve to follow your passions and not lose too much time and still keep your interest, I think, in skydiving going. And last year, Jake had a chance to pick up a, a law scholarship, but he, he turned that down to follow his entrepreneurial passions, which I think is rather good. So he started the, uh, the, the site Umfa, which is spelt, not as we spelt it, but double O-M-P-H-A-A. -A. No, double O-M-P-H-A. Umfa with an A, not an E-R. Wrong way around. No, With an ER. He'll, he'll fix it. Jake will show us. So please welcome Jake. <laughs> I'll just get this computer going and then. Uh... Perfect. Right, well, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, my talk's probably going to be somewhat different to um, some of the others you guys have heard, um, considering I got to the end of my year 13 year and did, as Lyle um, put it nicely, dropped out of school. Um, and I think um, it's quite interesting having, sort of looking over my time at school because um, one of the key things that we're always told as students is success means going to school, getting good grades, going to university and getting a degree. And that's what we're told. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying specifically at my school that's what we're told, but that's what, when I speak to my friends all over the country, that's what I believe we're told. So um, the topic I've been asked to speak about today is thinking big and following a, following a dream when choosing career options. So as Lyle said, um, in 2013, I was a student at Christchurch Boys High, um, and my story really began probably in about April of 2013 when I, my passion changed and I think that's something that happens a lot for young people is that there, there are so many interests and one day you want to be an airline pilot, the next day you want to be an astronaut and the next day you want to be a lawyer and you're always sort of changing what you want to do but for me I had been pretty consistent in what I'd wanted to do for probably about three years and I wanted to be a lawyer and that's what I'd always wanted to be for the, as far as I can remember about three years ago. 
three years ago. So that that was what I was considering and it seemed like the only option. And it was probably in about April last year where I sort of started reading quite a bit of um, entrepreneurial sort of books, probably far too much Richard Branson, and sort of changed my general direction and decided that actually no, law is not so much my interest and it's more business and entrepreneurial sort of business. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, as, as Lois said, I was a head boy at, at Boys High and, um, and when I worked out what my true passion was, I sort of knew I guess deep down that I could go to university and do law and commerce, or I could maybe not go to university. So um, I was at a legal conference here in Christchurch and the Dean of Law from Otago University, Mark Hennigan, great guy, was talking. And um, I went up to him afterwards and just had a bit of a, have, have a, bit of a chat. And um, he then emailed and, and offered me a $40,000 law scholarship. And I didn't do anything, I didn't subscribe, I didn't put in an application, it was just, a, it was, I was very lucky and he offered it to me. And that was the, one of the hardest decisions I had to make, was turning down such a good offer to do what I really wanted to do. And I think that's something that students need more inspiration to do, is actually work out where they want to go and then go and do it. So um, that's, that's what I did. So I worked out that I didn't need law or commerce, I guess, to be an entrepreneur. Um, sure, it may be helpful and it may, it may have, I mean, in, in 10 years I may say it might have got me further. I don't know. but. Um, I talked with mentors, teachers, family, and the overarching thing that they all said is go to university. It's such a good offer. Um, that's absolutely what you should do. And I said, why? And they said, because it's safe. There's, le there's less of a risk that at the end of the year or the end of your degree, you'll get a job. And that's what it came down to. So I made the decision not to study, and that was based off what I decided my passion was and my gut instincts. And it wasn't an easy decision, but at the same time, it was one of the easiest decisions I'd ever made because I knew what I really wanted to do. And it was an exciting decision, and I guess I knew where my heart was, and, and that's how I made my decision. So I'm not someone who doesn't advocate for going to university. I think university is a fantastic place, and people should go to university if that is part of their journey, right? But if it's not part of your journey, there's absolutely no point going there and wasting your time. And at the end of the day, if I fell over and broke my leg, there's no way I'd get surgery done by someone who hadn't studied medicine. If I was in a legal battle, I would not have a lawyer who didn't study law. So there's so many things out there that you need degrees to do. And if you want to do those things, absolutely go and do it. But for me, as I say, worked out what I wanted to do and it wasn't necessarily necessary, as I like to say. Um, so for entrepreneurs, musician, mus uh, musicians, uh, marketing gurus, account managers, whatever it may be, it, there are other ways to get there as opposed to doing the conventional pathway. Um, so I guess I was told it was all about being realistic, what I could realistically do, where does the good luck end? Um, but the truth is, from what I found, is luck, sure, it does play a part, but it is relatively small. And if people are really passionate about something, they'll make their own luck, is what I believe. And sure, my current business may easily fail. Um, there's a good chance it, it probably will. But um, looking over it, I think I've done enough groundwork to, which some people would say luck, that if that does happen, then there's plenty of other opportunities to move on to. So I think it's all about protecting the downside and any risk that you have. So um, at the end of, I mean, at the start of this year, I worked out that um, I'd moved out of uh, boarding school and into a house. I had $210 rent bill coming in each week and no job. Um, so I started working on my first business, Umpfa, um, as Lyle pointed out. And it's been a journey of about um, six to eight months of getting up and running. And we launched on July 14. So I'm just going to play a quick video now, which will explain what it is, and then I'll just follow up from that. Welcome to Umpha, powered by BNZ. Umpha inspires people to do extraordinary things through wise words from leaders in their fields. We are sick and tired of people taking the conventional approach at the expense of their dreams. Our remarkable contributors will provide you with the inspiration that you need to do what you really want to do. Umpha is here to encourage you, guide you, and mentor you so that you really can achieve extraordinary things. Umpha will remind you that no matter what you dream, you can do it, and Umpha will help you get there. So get involved and let the fun and adventure begin. It's going to be one crazy journey and there is no looking back. Umpfer is a destination, a place where you can come to, a world where you can escape to. Wise words await. Uh, you're very, very lucky being born on this planet, or not this planet, in this country. And uh, you must embrace that. There's not many Kiwis on, on this earth and uh, the majority of them are pretty special. 
and you guys are special. You know, so you've got to do it, and that's part of the Kiwi spirit. We do do it, you know, and, uh, and it's amazing what we can do as a race, you know, for such a small, small population. Just get out there, have fun, and be, be a Kiwi, you know, Absolutely. be a bit cheeky. Yeah. It's all right. Our 21st century form of journalism will inspire you to live a life that's out of this world. What would the 16 year old boy you were think of the band you've become? Would he recognise you? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. I think, I think he would. I think he'd go, yep, that's him. There's me. I knew you'd make it. <laughs> we are a community. A community of innovators, a community of leaders, a community of doers. New Zealand's a great place to live and uh, young people of New Zealand build the future for this country, so uh, making the more we've got making good decisions, the better. As Mike Pirro said, if you're a visionary or somebody looking for a better future for yourself or those around you, then bookmark the site. <laughs> best day. Uh, my best day is probably also my worst day. We want less information and more inspiration. We don't want people to survive, we want people to thrive. She then got to work auditioning her way into shows such as Jesus Christ Superstar and West End to Broadway. We'll be really delving into Steve's career and life as a coach, getting advice not just for aspiring coaches, but players too. This contributor is a friend of the environment who has a vision for a cleaner, greener, healthier planet. Do you think enough architects understand that today? No. This is Umpha. Wise words await. Um, so ultimately, um, it's, as I say, about knowing what you want out of life and creating a plan. So to there. ultimately, what we are so is a video off, interview with one last and tiny our video, vision which is a couple of minutes that lets people some die wondering talk. what they could have achieved. So how we're going to do that is we're going to interview people who have achieved remarkable things all over the world, and we're going to use their stories as inspiration what for students. So our interviews are more focused on what, what the contributor sort of has learnt from their journey Would or the journey like? of others, as opposed to their story as such. Because a lot of the people we're talking to, their stories are quite well known. Um, so we. Are getting their wise words, where the opportunities are today, the advice they want to pass on and similar. So we're primarily focusing on um, pushing those stories out there through schools, through universities, so that we can actually start at inspiration rather than starting at here's a whole lot of information, now decide what you want to do. So for us it's been um, a huge process of working with passionate sponsors, contributors, viewers, uh, to redefine the way I think careers are done in New Zealand because I mean, I had a fantastic careers advisor at Christchurch Boys, and I think there are lots of good examples over the country, but in general, what we found is that there's just not enough inspiration going on for students. And it's a harsh fact, but you talk to 90% of the students, you say, were you really inspired by the advice you were given? And I think you'll be surprised as to what you told. Um, or maybe not surprised. Um, so we're starting at the inspiration and saying, what inspires you? What do you really want to do? And then helping them create their journey from there. So we're looking at a big partnership with Careers New Zealand who may eventually take the site over and they're um, working through those details at the moment. So, so far we've recorded about 30 interviews and we're doing 54 this year. So stay tuned, we've got ones coming with Karen Walker, Trillis Cooper, Sarah Walker, Julie Christie, um, media people such as JJ Mike and Dom, Greg Murphy, John Key, Mahi Drysdale and a whole list of others of people all over the country um, who are doing great things. And also some global people as well, such as a New Zealander called Sarah Rob O'Hagan who was the most powerful, one of the most powerful women in the world in sports and she was the marketing manager for Nike um, for Virgin Atlantic at one point and now she's the president of a huge gym over in New York called Equinox. So people who are achieving globally and remarkable things um, as well as not just New Zealanders, people such as Shazi Vizram who we interviewed who's New York Entrepreneur of the Year 2011, founded a um, baby food company that's now worth $100 million five years later. So people who are doing amazing things all over the world, we're getting their stories and fostering them and working out what is the key aspect to it that we can pass on to our students. Um, so just to finish off, why, why are dreams important? And I think, um, I think today we have thousands of students all over the country who are in degrees that they don't want to be doing. And it's as simple as that. And I know of at least 30 examples of students and my friends. I say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm studying accounting. Great. Do that's fantastic. What do you want to do with that? Oh, I don't know. I'm just here because my parents said I should do accounting. You know? And that's what we're trying to change. If someone, we, just, we want people to do what they want to do, not what the crowd's doing. Um, so for me, um, I guess it's about finding out what your core uh, goals are in life or looking forward and going, where do I want to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then creating a plan to get there. So for me personally, I know that in my life I want fun, family, freedom, 
and um, a few other things as well, which I've written down somewhere on this list. Um, so basically, I think when you know what you want to do, it's so much easier to create your journey moving into the future. Um, so um, just to finish off here, um, I guess in terms of the topic, um, what are some new secondary tertiary learning pathways designed for real work opportunities and expectations? Well, firstly, in my opinion, it starts with inspiration. What do people actually want to do? Secondly, it starts with helping them grow that passion into something. And thirdly, it's about supporting them in that journey. And what we want is people who are as passionate about their jobs as Malcolm obviously was today. Um, so ultimately, um, it's, as I say, about knowing what you want out of life and creating a plan to get there. So to finish off, I'm just going to play one last tiny video, which is a couple of minutes, which sums up my talk. Thank you, Jake. That's wonderful. More inspiration and less uh, information. What do I desire? I mean, the courage to pursue the desires. Fantastic. Now, can we just uh, throw the, uh, the mic open to people who might like to comment or uh, ask questions of our, of our panel? Malcolm will move among you and, yes. Yes. Right, sorry, did someone have a hand up somewhere? Um, thank you. As, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, there's a lot of people that I want personally to meet and follow up later on from this conference. But then I was thinking, you are the one I want my children meet after the conference. And I'm just thinking that maybe for most of us who are here, are actually mothers or fathers, and also teachers, researchers. Um, but to my mind, and perhaps much to my heart right now, is coming this question about my own children and how that relates to my um, research in life and the reasons why I'm here. But actually this statement, I think, is very powerful more inspiration and less information. And um, I have been working in um, research and consultancy in, in South America for uh, some years. And actually what I keep in mind and heart most of the times is um, the description that um, high school boy made of his own educational journey. He was the kind of boy that probably many teachers would say, oh, he's engaged. You know, he will be participating in different school activities. And if teachers were um, suggesting projects, he would probably raise up his hand and say, yes, yes, I'm in. But then when he had a chance to reflect on his own journey, he said, you know, teachers or universities are coming here to my school to offer different careers. But I don't know how to answer because I don't know who I am. I don't know what is my strength. I don't know which is my weakness. I, so he was basically looking for questions that maybe can be described as, I don't know, existentially, ex about existence, about his, his deeper inner motivation. So um, this is just to tell you that I have been carrying out with these words that he said to me five years ago. In, um, and hopefully, my children would meet you sometime in the future. Thank you. <laughs> other questions or comments? And, and then, then we'll pass the mic back to the panel. So other comments from the floor first? Thanks for um, the presentations. They're really inspiring and very thought-provoking from all of you. And I want to sort of pull together a statement that Margaret made mm -hmm. and then run it against something that the students said in the video that you showed, Malcolm, I think kind of hooks into what Jake was talking about as well. 
Um, and Miranda, you said this too, part, part of the aim of what you're doing is to make school or polytechnic a real world experience to benefit students. And then when I heard the comments from the, uh, the young woman at Stack saying, having a part of saying building the new Christchurch makes me feel like this is an important place. And there must be some way to kind of combine those two ideas at the university, the polytechnic and the schools. Mm -hmm. It's part of the share, idea, share an idea thing, but on a much grander scale. Other comments first, and then we'll have some feedback. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Johnson, Rangiora High School. Um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the panel and the presenters. I, I, personal reflections, I started with a lump in my throat at Malcolm's presentation. <laughs> um, absolutely beautiful to see that passion and, and you don't always have to know. I don't know what I'm doing, but I just follow my gut feeling. <laughs> so started with a lump in the throat. Um, as somebody who's been through 10 years of STEM education in the UK, I take my hats off to Linwood. It is absolutely inspirational what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. To Miranda for following up in the CPIT tertiary level is absolutely mm -hmm. invaluable. And when you just don't think it will get any better than what Malcolm started at the beginning, uh, young Jake stands up there and has got the courage and the determination to do what he knows he feels is correct. And I'd just like to ask him one big question as, who was your main inspiration to give you that courage? He's going to say me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, were, there was a lot, a lot of people, but I think if I had to say one person, it would be actually Richard Branson. Um, and I did read way too, I say way too much because it sort of changed my whole perception on things. But for, for a while, my key interest was, was politics. And not, not so much today, but it was for a while. And I, I really saw myself getting into politics one day. And I thought, right, I don't want to try and get into politics too early because I don't want to spend my whole life doing it. But I'd like to do business first and then p potentially go into politics in later life. So that's how it all started off for me, my interest in business and actually looking at business. And then I sort of got reading about business and realised I actually loved entrepreneurship and loved it and didn't actually really want to leave it and just wanted to do it. Um, and it all started with Richard Branson's autobiography. So that was um, the key inspiration and obviously lots and lots of other people along the way. Cool, thank you. I just want to say the, the impact of, of what we're here the last two days is, is going to be absolutely beyond what any of us can imagine, I think, because the wonderful work that these guys are doing, and hopefully us as leaders will, will carry on today, um, I don't think you can underestimate the impact it's going to have, and I'm really glad that I made the jump from the UK to here. Right. It was a very good choice. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Other comments? Today, the, the last two days, I think, have been really inspirational from the young people who started off yesterday to Jake just now. And I'm reminded of truisms that guide your thinking as you take on the journey that Jake is about, well, has started on. And there are a couple of things which have resonated with me and been drawn out of my memory bank in the, <laughs> in the last 24 hours. The first one is team, time, and relationships. You have to have teams working together. You have to have time to achieve things, and you won't get anywhere unless you have good relationships within the teams. But there's something more important as well. We're trying, and our whole focus is on citizenship for New Zealanders as global citizens. And I'm reminded of a very significant piece of work done by a group that was presented to UNESCO some years ago now, and it's, it's the Delors Dictum. Our focus is learning to do, learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. And if we achieve that, and if we are able, in the, what we do in schools and in the community, we will have young people coming through 
who are able to make informed decisions about themselves. And so I think the messages we've had over the last 24 hours, Lyle, have been very, very significant. Mm, <laughs> well, perhaps give the last word to people on the panel if you want to say anything more to, to uh, wrap this up. Just uh, some brief comments. Not compulsory, but if you... Stunned, like stunned into silence. Okay. Uh, well then, can, can I just uh, conclude by uh, asking you to join me and thank our wonderful panel for their preparation and delivery.